In this class, we will be talking about Postgres architecture. In Postgres, you commonly hear a word called cluster, and sometimes that word is confusing enough. If you come from a different RDBMS server like MySQL or Oracle SQL Server, the word cluster usually means a group of servers, right? However, in Postgres, when we talk about a cluster, it's nothing but a collection of databases. So a single Postgres server or instance can contain multiple databases. So cluster here means a collection of databases hosted together. Like we discussed, clusters in other RDBMS like MySQL or Oracle might have a different meaning. Usually in MySQL, when you say cluster, it means a group of servers. But in Postgres, it has a different meaning. A server can sometimes have multiple Postgres instances running on different ports and each database can have multiple schemas. For example, employee tables can be stored in a schema called employee and accounts tables. There are different schemas. Inside a database, you can have multiple schemas and each schema can contain multiple objects like tables, indexes, views, etc. So that is the hierarchy in Postgres. We have cluster, which is a group of databases. And in each database, we have multiple schemas. And in each schema, we have multiple objects. This is the hierarchy of objects in Postgres. In Postgres terminology, the database cluster means collection of databases, as we discussed. And a database is nothing but a collection of schemas, which in turn have tables and views, etc. A schema is a collection of objects, which can have multiple tables, views, functions, etc. And the word relation in Postgres typically means table or index, and it can be confusing sometimes if you come from a different RDBMS background. A tuple refers to a row, attribute refers to a column or field in a table, and an instance by default runs on 5432 and it is possible to have multiple instances on a single server. These are some of the common terms you see in Postgres when you work with databases. Here's a diagram that explains the concepts that we've discussed so far. In this diagram, we have a database cluster, and on this database cluster, we have two databases. One is employee, the second is accounts. These are two databases, and underneath this database, we have two schemas. Under one, we have one schema, the department, and the other schema being geo. Underneath the other database, the two schemas we have are payroll and reporting. Under each schema, we have objects like we discussed, tables, indexes, and views. This schema has different types of objects. This is the object hierarchy in Postgres. Now we're going to talk about the directories that get created when you run initdb. So initially when you set up Postgres and initialize the cluster, you run a command called initdb. And when that runs, these are the things that happen in the background. It creates a new database cluster, creates directories that it needs, creates Postgres and template DBs, generates shared catalog tables, and there are more steps. We are going to talk about all the directories that get created when initdb happens and all the other files that get created. So what are the directories that get created by default when you initialize the cluster? These are some of the important directories that are created at that time. First is pgwall. This contains the wall files. The wall files are really important for replication and point in time recovery. We're going to talk more about wall files in depth in replication chapter and backup recovery. Global is a subdirectory containing cluster-wide tables such as pgdatabase. This directory contains the cluster-wide tables. The base is important. This is a subdirectory containing the actual table files, and there is a pgdatabase subdirectory. If you have multiple databases under the cluster, you have multiple subdirectories, and then you have the relation files underneath. pgrepslot is a subdirectory containing replication slot data. What are replication slots? We're going to talk about it in the replication chapter, but this directory contains all the replication slot data. pglogical contains the status data for logical decoding. Primarily, this is used for logical replication. The pg table spec is a subdirectory containing symbolic links of table spaces. So if you're using multiple table spaces, this directory has some important information there. It has the symbolic links. PG stat temp contains temporary files for the stat subsystem, and there are more directories that get created. I'm only talking about the important ones, but there are some more which we're going to talk about later. Other than the directories, here are the other important files that get created when we initialize the cluster. The PG version file contains the major version number of Postgres. Let's say you want to quickly check what is the Postgres version you're running. You can check this file. 
The PG HBA conf is really important for user access. We're going to talk in depth about this file in user access chapter, but this is really important for the user. When a user tries to access, this file is checked whether it has an entry in the appropriate entry with the IP address, username, etc. But this is really important. The Postgres QL conf is the configuration file which has all the list of parameters like how much you want to accelerate for shared buffers, effective cache size, etc. All the important parameters are defined in this comp file and it's very, very important. There's also the auto comp file. The difference with this is this file has any dynamic changes that are made by alter system command that are written to this file. But all the static changes are in, which were written before and are in this one. When you do a dynamic change using alter system command, that gets written to this file. We're going to talk more about the differences between these files in the configuration section. For now, you can just get an overview of these files. We're only talking about these four, ignoring the other two because they're not as popular as these. But we are going to touch on those topics as well in the future. Cloud DB School. Either we adapt or we slowly fade away. So what's happening in the DBA space? The DBA role is evolving. Either we adapt or we slowly fade away. This is correct. So what about this quote here? DBA role is dying. Rip DBA. This is wrong. DBA role is not going away. There's nothing to worry about. Social proof. Jonathan Lewis, a world-class Oracle expert, I'm worried about the future of DBAs. This is a quote taken from the internet. Either we adapt or we slowly fade away. I was a DBA too, but made the transition to DBE. So it's an evolution. This is a quote taken from a DBA. Major technology trends are reshaping the DBA role at many organizations. This is another quote we found from another article on the internet. Oracle and SQL Server DBAs should learn Postgres, MySQL, Ansible, RDS, Aurora, DynamoDB, Automation, etc. RDS Aurora needs database engineers, especially when there are many RDS instances. A Google search for death of the DBA or DBA title dying will yield something like this. This is an example, an excerpt of Google search results. So how do we evolve? Learn open source, Postgres and MySQL. Learn RDS. Learn Aurora. Learn DynamoDB. Cloud migration techniques. GCP Postgres and MySQL services. Azure Postgres and MySQL services. Automation using Ansible, Terraform, and more. These are some of the technologies you should learn in order to evolve. How Cloud DB School can help you. Currently, you can learn the below by enrolling today. More topics will be added on a monthly basis. Postgres, RDS, Aurora, DynamoDB, cloud migration using SCT and DMS, and you can prepare for the AWS database specialty exam. Again, more will be added each month. Here are the courses you can enroll in today for Postgres. Postgres architecture, installation, RPM and source, user access, backup and recovery, Streaming Replication, PG Bouncer, PG Pool, Monitoring, PG Stat Statements and PG Stat Activity, Monitoring PG Badger, and Monitoring Prometheus and Grafana based. For Aurora, you can learn Creating Aurora Cluster, Aurora Cluster with Terraform, Connectivity Issues, Restoring from On-Prem Server to Aurora Cluster, Aurora Backups and Restores, Monitoring Aurora Cluster, Aurora Global Cluster, Aurora cloning, Aurora backtracking, and Aurora serverless. For RDS, you can learn creating RDS using console, CLI, or Terraform, RDS backup and restores, RDS HA, multi-AZ versus read replicas, managing RDS, stop, start, and modify, RDS monitoring, events and alarms, RDS versus Aurora. For DynamoDB, we offer DynamoDB introduction, DynamoDB Consistency Levels, Querying DynamoDB, DynamoDB Backup and Recovery, DynamoDB Global Tables, and DynamoDB TTL. We also offer database migration courses with SCT and DMS, showing you how to use those different demos. If you use Oracle, SQL Server, MySQL, Postgres, TB2, or Sybase, any of these courses that we offer may be helpful to you. Again, we will be offering new courses every month. So the question is, why should you pay $4.99 per year to enroll? We offer our services for a one-time fee of $499 US per year to enroll, roughly $41 per month. 
With this, you get access to all of our current courses to enroll in, along with any that will be added within your year of enroll. You'll get access to Postgres, RDS, Aurora, DynamoDB, Cloud Migration, and AWS DB Specialty courses today. More courses will be added on a monthly basis, and all new content will be available to you as we publish it. Automation courses are coming soon. You can check our Cloud DB blogs to see our previous work in this space. The DBA role is evolving. Accept the change and start learning and acquiring new skills. Either we adapt or we slowly fade away. Here are some of the most frequently asked questions from our website. Can I get a free trial? Will I be able to clear AWS database specialty exam after enrolling? I'm an Oracle SQL Server DB2 Sybase MySQL slash other DBA. How will I benefit from your courses? How will I contact you if I need more information? Answers to all these questions and more can be found on our FAQ page on our website. And remember, if you need any additional information, feel free to reach out to us.